Welcome back, ladies, to another episode of the Empowered Expat Wife podcast. I'm so excited to be back with you and to present another special guest, Sonia Siegler. Thank you so much for being here today. I appreciate it. Thank you for asking. And so I'm so excited about this um, session because I know I'm going to learn a lot and obviously the audience also. So um, and let me introduce Sonia real quick to you all. Um, Sonia is a business strategist and consultant, as well as an executive leadership coach and a published author. Um, she creates practical game plans for people who are looking to reinvent themselves or grow professionally. Um, she has extensive experience as an operations and legal executive, covers startups to Fortune 500 companies, and she has also been an in-house lawyer for over 25 years. And if this isn't already really impressive, she's also done all that while also being an expat herself and raising three sons. So <laughs> that's, that's a lot, a lot of accomplishments. <laughs> that last one about being the raising three kids, that's the badge of honor. <laughs> yeah, I think so too. <laughs> Excellent. So, um, you know, in previous episodes uh, of this podcast, we tackled topics like finding your purpose across borders, um, starting a portable business, or creating a killer CV to find employment in different, you know, in different countries or even back home upon um, repatriating. And despite all the gaps and the relocations and everything that can kind of get in the way sometimes. But I know that still many expat wives will feel a bit overwhelmed and stuck when it comes to taking the next steps um, towards their own professional development. So what would you recommend these women to do in order to overcome their own doubts or anything else that could hold them back from getting started? There are a couple things that I think are very important to keep up to date. First, you talk about a CV and creating a killer CV, and I'm glad you've had people on to help with that because that can be a sticking point for people. They don't want to put their hat in the ring or they don't want to put their name out there because they don't feel like they've actually got a good CV or resume. They don't feel like they've got a good list of accomplishments because there are those gaps and there are those, um, you know, uh, uh, lack of consistency, if you will. And I think it's important to remember, keep everything updated. So keep all of LinkedIn, keep your resume, keep your CV, keep all of that updated because you never know when you're going to have one of those conversations where people say, oh, I know someone, send it over to me and I'll forward it. So you never know when that's going to happen. And then the other part is if you keep it up to date, you've eliminated that stumbling block and that's huge. I know if I have to send it out and I have to, you know, I haven't updated it in three years, then you're like, oh, what did I even do the last three years? Yeah. Uh, so it can be a huge stumbling block. And I think if you keep it updated, um, it just removes that stumbling block and makes it so much easier to, to help yourself when you do find something interesting. And I think the other part that can really help um, lessen the um, feelings of overwhelm or lessen the feeling of, oh, I've got this gap, I need to figure out how to address it, or I just don't even want to address it. Um, I've been working with this woman who's been raising kids and homeschooling them for 15 years. Wow. And she's been doing some work on the side in those 15 years. And she's a lawyer, so professional, smart woman. And yet she feels like she can't submit her resume for full-time jobs right now because she's got this gap. And I'm like, look, you've done the work. You've done all of this. You have the experience. It's not like licensing has changed. You know, your skills are up to date. So I would say keep the skills up to date, that's one thing. And then I think the other thing is when you know your top three to five skills and you can tell stories in your experience, no matter when it was, so even if there is a gap of three years and you have experience and I, my, my uh, favorite skill and uh, strength is organizing chaos. And I'll talk more about this uh, in a bit, but I have stories around that at each company I've been, at each volunteer activity I've done. So I can pull those out at a conversation um, to explain what I've been doing and what my skill is and what I can bring to the table. So I don't think those gaps matter so much as being able to articulate your top skills and talk about what you've done and bring your experience 
into the conversation to help explain it. So I think keeping your resume up to date is part of it, but the other part is knowing right off the bat what your top skills are. And if you're an expat wife, organization is gonna be one of those. <laughs> yeah, pretty sure of it as well. And I love that when you really focus on that and you don't leave it, like you said, uh, you don't leave it, you know, somewhere during three years and then all of a sudden it's like, ooh, what did I do the past three years? And everything in retrospect might seem like it's nothing. But when you actually keep this mindset and mentality of what have I achieved now? You know, maybe it was in a volunteering position also. Yeah. Where you just had great accomplishments and looking out for those in order to add them to your LinkedIn or your CV I think that's such a, a nice mindset hack also to have, to really keep up your confidence. And I think, you know, the other part, now that you're, you're saying about that, reminds me, um, I've got a group where we talk to each other. Okay, what do you think my top skills are? And these are two other ladies. We did fundraising together. And so it's like, okay, what do you think my top skills are? And we kind of did that for each other. And it was better because it's not you trying to come up with everything in a vacuum. Like, yeah. remember, what did we even do over the last three years? <laughs> yeah. So it was helpful to have a conversation with other people that I had in that particular capacity volunteered with to be able to hear what they thought. And, and that was really helpful. Mm, I love that. And especially a lot of women are so humble when it comes to their accomplishments that I think that's really a really helpful tip for them. Um, all right. So then in your book, uh, Welcome to the Next Level, you talk about take an inventory of how you spent your time and creating a requirements roadmap. I thought that was so interesting. Can you tell us a little more about that? Yeah, one of the things I have clients do is um, go through a day or a week and kind of keep track of what they're doing. Um, I think people lose track of how they spend their time at work or how they spend their time at home and they're like, oh, I didn't do anything. And so it's a really good way to be more granular about what you're actually accomplishing. And a requirements roadmap is really a list of things that you want to have in your life or your job. And you can do it for anything. You can do it for your job or you can do it for how you want your family to be or you could do it for a volunteer activity. We did it um, when we moved about 10 months ago, we did it for a house uh, and where we wanted to be in location because we were no longer tied to um, the San Francisco Bay Area. My youngest graduated from high school. So we're like, okay, where do we want to go next? Um, and so we put a list of requirements together and that's must haves and then a list of nice to haves and then a list of cannot haves. Mm -hmm. And um, most people, no, I don't want this. I don't want a boss that's a jerk. I don't want a place that's kind of backbiting, backstabbing. I want something more collaborative. So is the collaboration and that aspect of it is a requirement? Like if it doesn't have it, you're going to walk away from it? Or is it a nice to have? Like, yes, I would prefer to be in an environment where my coworkers are collaborative and, and not hoarding information and not backstabbing and hiding the ball. So those kind of requirements. Another one is commuting. Do you have to drive an hour or do you have to take the bus or train an hour? Um, those kind of things. The others I see, and then usually it's a short list of maybe six things, six to 10 things. Uh, and the list of cannot have are deal breakers. So if it has, for example, I won't work for people I don't like. So if it has an asshole boss, I'm not doing that. Or if that work I'm taking on, I'm not doing it. Um, so what you actually want, so those requirements. When we did it for the house here, we had a list of requirements, we had a list of nice to haves, and then we had a list of cannot haves. And you know, it was, um, it was, it was fun putting that together because as we drove around to different areas, um, we're kind of in the Portland area now, and we drove like uh, maybe an hour south of the city, and we're like, okay, this is too far from the airport. I need to be within like 15 to 30 minutes of an airport because I do a lot of traveling for work. So when we were looking at all these beautiful places and rural and farms, it was so beautiful, but you're like, that is a long way to the airport. That's not gonna work. So then we shrank it to like a half an hour and we were like, that is still too far. And so then we shrunk it to like 15 minutes <laughs> and looked at that geographic area. So that kind of requirements list is what I'm talking about in terms 
of being clear about what you want. Yeah. I like that. And um, I'm just thinking there's this term that, that has been out there a lot that is uh, decision fatigue, when you have to take so many decisions. And I think this is a, a way to really um, narrow it down so much because now you, you, you just have to see, is it in my uh, requirements? Is it in my nice to have? Or is it in my cannot have? So the decision yeah. process is already like really shrunk down which makes it so, so much easier. It's very easy to make those decisions when you've yeah. got clarity like that. And that's exactly. the clarity. making roadmaps with people. This is it. And that's the beginning of what that looks like. Yeah. And, and like you said in the beginning, I mean, uh, women can do that. Expat women can do that professionally. They could do it for their relationship, for their children, for the next destination that they'll, they'll go to or not. Um, so this is a really helpful tool to just have clarity and, and uh, take better and easier decisions. And I also yeah, really like, like mm -hmm. I was just going to say, I, the requirements roadmap, we did that when we, before we went to Singapore, we're like, okay, what does success look like? So we, let's say we spent our time there and we come back and we're looking over what we did. What would be success? And we kind of made a list of like what it would feel like like the actual feelings it would evoke. We made a list of um, things we would do, people we would see, things to explore. Um, and then we just kind of fit that in for our time there. And so it was like, okay, I'm gonna feel really successful if we do these eight things. And I'm gonna feel like we knocked it out of the park if we do these 12 things. And so it was really great to have an idea going in and have that clarity as opposed to, okay, now what? I don't know anybody here. I have never taken the subway here. You know, that kind of yeah. feeling, feeling. So that really helped. Yeah, I can imagine. And talking about uh, getting more clarity, which is clearly so important in, in life in general, expat or rec regular, <laughs> quote unquote. Um, I know you're also a big advocate for creating vision boards. So uh, can you tell us more about how this can help women to feel uh, who, who just feel a bit stuck, uh, get more clarity of their goals and inspire them to dream a little bigger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Vision boards are kind of a roadmap for the universe, for, for your path in the universe. And I think if you can put pictures together or words together that can evoke a feeling or um, a way of being, it can signal your brain, yes, that's what I want. And if you're looking at it on a daily basis, like I keep mine on the, on my closet wall. So when I'm getting dressed, I, I can do when I open it up, because I'm a little embarrassed to have it like out there, you know, for everyone to see, but it's perfect when you open up the closet wall. Yeah. It's, a, it's such a good daily reminder. And then I have my business one on the back of my office door. So like right now when the door shut and there's a recording yeah. progress sign on the door, I can see the vision board. So it's good. Um, but that clarity of what you want and that daily reminder can keep it just front and center for you and, and your um, desires. And I think also when you've got that kind of clarity, it makes saying yes and no, just like we talked about that requirements list. It makes it very easy to say, yes, this is in alignment with what I want or no, it's not in alignment. Is there another good reason for me to say yes to this or should I just say no and be fine with that? Mm -hmm. And I think when we're indecisive, it's because we don't know where it's fitting on our list. We don't know, does it help me get to my goal? Does it not? And what happens is people meet their goals and then they don't set new ones or they don't have very clear ones. And so when they go to make a decision, they're like, is this getting me closer to what I want or is it not getting me closer to what I want? And so that clarity of having that vision board and that daily reminder of it is so helpful. Yeah. I think so too. And I love that you mentioned um, picking pictures that make you feel good because the feeling is really the biggest motivator, right? Much bigger than the goal itself. It's the, how do I think this goal will make me feel? So um, just making sure that it doesn't feel like too much of a stretch or like that's actually someone else. I think it's kind of nice, but actually it's not really me. Just really thinking, okay, let me pull out pictures from magazines, from the internet. There's endless possibilities. And it's such a fun activity to do, even with kids, right? I mean, they could start. Oh, yeah. yeah it's you know, what's interesting? 
interesting. I did this uh, a little bit differently with my boys um, during the summers. So when school would get out, we would go to Great America, which is an amusement park. Um, and we would have fun for the day and then we would go camping for a week. So it was a really good break between summer and school. And one of the things we would do is we would talk about what do we want to do for the rest of the summer? Mm -hmm. um, you know, do you want to go traveling? Do you want to go to the beach? Um, do you want to go see grandma? You know, what do we want to do for the next whatever, 10, 12 weeks? And so we would come up with a list. Everybody could throw in the, you know, three or four things. And so we'd make a list you know, berry picking, you know, picking strawberries, you know, whatever it was, we put it on the list and we make sure to kind of fit that in. So it wasn't really a vision board, like with pictures or words, but it was like, what do we want to do? And so that became our kind of fun list to do for the summer. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a little bit yeah. different way of incorporating kids. Another way I've done it, I've done um, workshops with high schoolers okay. and I have to tell you, they're so brilliant because they, they are not jaded. They are not like overwhelmed by the weight of, you know, a mortgage or kids that they're just brilliant about what they want and, and the clarity of that. And I never want that to go away for people. And I'm always trying to get people back to that level of innocence uh, when I work with them, because all of those messages of what you should do and what career path you should follow, um, those kind of drown out our own voices. And when I work with high schoolers, they have a strong voice and it's really great. And when they put their vision boards together, I've had them do like a nine square, like an Instagram. Okay. <laughs> oh, that's a good move. Yeah. Square pictures. And so they're just very creative and I, you know, it's very fun to work with them. That's great. That's such a great idea. Ah, excellent. And um, let me ask you something else. So um, when it comes to just feeling a bit stuck and like, I'm not sure, you know, should I um, continue working? Should I, should I get back into business or, or, or start a business maybe? So I think um, one of the things that uh, holds many expat wives back, apart from the relocations, obviously, is that they just lack a support network. So especially if the kids are smaller, uh, but also maybe later, we, we just kind of feel, and I know this is true for myself also, that we kind of need to overcompensate for the grandparents not being here, old family friends not being here. So you kind of want to take on the roles of, of, of all the others that are missing. Yeah. But apart from that, also what I've noticed in my work with clients is that sometimes it's also the husbands who discourage their wives from pursuing a career or entrepreneurship um, maybe because, you know, it's not necessary, uh, money, money wise, or they're, you know, what, whatever they want reason. support too. Yeah. Yeah. They want the support too. They're maybe worried that now the wife is not going to be available for, for, for them or for household tasks or whatever it is. So do you think that these women in, in such a situation with such, um, doubts, should they pursue their professional career anyway? And if so, how can they best navigate this kind of scenario where they're not very supported? Yeah, I think it goes back to what we chatted about earlier in terms of the clarity. Like, what do you want to be doing? Do you want something that's full time? Do you want something that's part time? Do you want something that's volunteer so that you keep busy and keep engaged with other adults? Uh, or you just know the area better or you get to know other people? I mean, I personally like to do the culture and the food and just be immersed in wherever I am, whether I speak the language or not. Um, but that's, that's one thing to consider is what do you actually want to be doing? I think over the last four or five years, my husband and I, one of our goals was to be able to work from anywhere in the world. And so we've, he's in IT support and his job was remote anyway. And then I worked my coaching business over the last um, four years to be remote and I can do it from anywhere. So I've like recorded all my content and that kind of thing. And so it doesn't matter where I am, but if, if you're just getting into a business, is it something you could do from anywhere? Or is it something you have to be tied to a position? And if it is, let's talk about a job that's tied to a geographic location. So if you've moved, let's just say Singapore, if you've moved to Singapore, how do you insert yourself into that society? And, and that's a very cosmopolitan society from crossroads of the world. So how do you insert yourself into that? 
one thing I usually counsel people to do is network with a purpose. So groups like the expat women, um, other groups like that, I was advised, hey, meet with them. They meet like the first Thursday of the month, um, get to know them. And I always recommend getting to know three people like at each meeting or each event you go to, meet at least three people and ask them in somewhere in the conversation, is there someone else I need to know? So if you're looking for a job in marketing and you know you're gonna be there for let's say 18 months, um, then that gives you good parameters and good clarity for what you can do during that time period and where you're going to be. So then you can ask for referrals. Who else do I need to know? Or who do you think I should talk to either within the group or outside in their own network? So I think that's helpful. Um, before you even go, um, one of the things I did was look up other members. So I'm part of association of corporate counsel. So in-house lawyers, and I looked up, okay, who do I know there? Do I know anybody there, first of all? And then if I don't know them, who is a member of the same group that is in that geographic location? And then I searched on LinkedIn, who do I know who knows them? So then I tried to do a little bit of triangulation of who, who do I know that could introduce me to them? And then if not, I'm pretty comfortable being bold and just reaching out to them and saying, hey, I'm gonna be in Singapore um, for the next 18 months, you know, I'd really like to get a job in marketing in this kind of industry, let's say software. Um, who do you know that I should talk to in that area? And I'd love to meet you when I get over there, something like that. That kind of outreach is really important to do because you're kind of paving the path for when you get there. The other group that I was a part of um, that is worldwide is Vistage and it's a peer-to-peer -peer CEO networking group. And so I contacted people there. I also asked the chair of my particular group, who do you know there that you can introduce me to? So that was work before actually getting there. When you get on the ground and you go to those um, events and you try to uh, meet people and you start meeting people for coffee or lunch or whatever, then you ask for those referrals. One of the things that I did was I was trying to coordinate meetings with people and it was so it was gonna be so many meetings and I had very limited time to do it. So I ended up having an open house we did um, uh, Morton's Steakhouse has this happy hour where they have like steak sandwiches and, and um, cocktails. And so I'm like, let's just do a happy hour from like five to seven. I invited everybody I was trying to schedule lunches with and so they could just come when it was convenient for them after work. And that was a really great way to reconnect with actually several former colleagues that I had worked with here in the US and then also new people that I was trying to meet. So that was one way I could get more people um, rather than trying to meet with them individually. The other um, part that I think was important, not just the clarity and the people, but um, new people. So being able to be outgoing and meet new people, whether it's moms at the school, whether it's um, former colleagues that you may have worked with, whether it's new people in a group like the expat women. Um, I think that you have to get good at that. Yeah. Um, and you kind of have to let your fears go um, to really go for what you want. So I think keeping your end goal in mind of, yes, I do want to be working. Um, you mentioned when the spouses aren't that supportive and that can happen for a couple reasons. Like I said, they feel like they want the support and it's already hard enough on them, you know, going somewhere else and reestablishing their network, reestablishing their credibility and they want that support. That's hugely important. I know with my husband, we've been together four years. Um, he's hugely supportive and and that makes an enormous difference and so if you feel like your spouse isn't supportive it can be hard because now you're feeling like you're an island of one <laughs> um and and i think building that support for for other people among other people is important to do pretty immediately and if there's um events through the spouse's company or events through um, the school or anywhere you're trying to integrate that those are important to go to because you never know who's going to be connected to what and I think it's just um, important to be open to that kind of networking so I think you have to keep your end goals in mind and do you want someone else undermining that and do you want to allow that or do you want to keep going for what you want and then if you're 
spouse is feeling like they're not supported, how can you make your spouse feel more supported so they are more supportive of you and what you want? So that's kind of a fine line to walk. Yeah, a fine line, exactly. So I, I see, yeah. <laughs> Just trying to basically uh, do, do it all and uh, maybe even see how you can combine it. Like maybe you want to go to all of these events that, you're, that your partner is invited to but you go with the with the purpose in mind and the end goal in mind that you too want to do your own networking in order to because let's not forget i mean even though the 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 stay abroad may just be a couple of years sometimes then oftentimes then you'll go to another destination but um it's not just about what's happening right now in the short term i think it's really important to again think of the end goal where do you where do you see yourself in 10 years yeah. Um, maybe uh, now that I'm not, now that I'm mentioning that, could you just say? Would you say there's ever a time where I, I can already hear some some women say, "Well, I, I guess I've missed my chance because I haven't worked in ten or fifteen years. Um, <laughs> now it's it might be too late." What What would you say to them? It's never too late. You know, I want to bring two stories. One of which I learned yesterday. Um, and one is, is one of my friends. She's 75 and she just got her real estate license. She ended up having to move out of the home that she was in because the lady she was renting from died and her kids decided to sell the house. So a house she thought she was going to be in until she died, she had to move. And so she's like, well, if I have to move, I'm going to have to pay significantly more rent. And so she's like, now what do I do to support myself? And so she ended up getting her real estate license at 75. So you, you can do whatever you set your mind. <laughs> and the other one that I just learned of yesterday is the woman who founded Low and Sons and she makes bags, like purses and backpacks and travel bags. She started that business at 65. Yeah. And now it's a $65 million business. Wow, incredible. Her sons help her. So they're all in it together. So she's now 76. So she's been doing this for 11 years. How amazing is that success story? So whatever you're trying, and she did it because she couldn't find a travel bag that she liked that was light enough for her to lift and put in the overhead bin. So she was solving a problem that she had mm -hmm. um, because she couldn't find something out, out there that fit the bill for what she needed. So she solved her own problem and in the process built her own business. That's incredible. I also yeah. had a client who was in, in her 50s and she had worked just after graduating from university. Then they went from destination to destination and uh, now came back and she was first, she was really hesitant, like, will this happen for me? I would like to get back to work. My kids are grown, uh, but will this, will this be possible? And in the end, she did. In, in, in no time, she got a job offer and it's, it's exactly like she had envisioned it, like you said, with clarity, that she didn't want a full-time job. She wanted a part-time job that would still allow her to do other things on the side. And so I guess, bottom line, ladies, it's never too late. There's always going to be some kind of excuse, but oh, yeah. really when you look at what is possible, like the, the two ladies that you mentioned before, my client, um, it's always possible. It's more about your own mindset than about the, 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 the objective possibilities. Yeah. And you know what? I, the second book that I just wrote, uh, what's next for my career, it is all about that mindset. And it is all about those self-limiting beliefs and those excuses and the stories we tell ourselves um, that can keep us stuck. So it's really important to kind of dig deeper and, and uncover those self-limiting beliefs and those uh, fears because everyone has them, they're universal, men and women, um, and be able to get past it because do you want someone else keeping you from your goals? I mean, it's already hard enough when we keep ourselves from our own goals, but, you know, listening to other people. So how can you train your brain basically to say, no, I'm, what I want is more important than all these fears and all these self-limiting beliefs and to be able to go for it because it's, it's so um, disheartening to see so many women holding themselves back when they're just one step away from being able to take a step down the path that they want. Yeah, I think so too.
And I, I just really quickly want to add what I think is so important here, and it has been for me, is surrounding yourself with people who will actually inspire, motivate, uplift you. Uh, so uh, my, my mastermind group, I'm in a, in, a, in a business mastermind, I'm in a coaching mastermind. I'm just trying to surround myself with people who daily show me there is more. There is even more that we can do. There's more that's out there for us. And, uh, you know, we're all going to support each other in getting there. So if you maybe, you know, your friends aren't so supportive, maybe your husband's not supportive, that's fine. You don't need to ditch them, but look for another group on the side that is, and that's actually going to motivate you and inspire you because I think it's so, so worth it. Yeah. I think looking up to someone, so someone who has started their business, someone who has, um, found a position and finding out, talking to them, how did they do it? What did they do to achieve that? How do you juggle everything? Um, and I think looking at like the five people that you spend the most time with and, and are they supportive or do they have that negative voice and are they complaining? Um, do they reinforce that negativity or are they saying, go for what you want? Are they being supportive? Are they helping you, you know, take a look at your resume? Like, how are they actually treating you? And I think it'll be very clear on who you need to spend more time with yeah. <laughs> or seek out and spend more time with. Yeah. yeah, that support team is really important. Yeah, great. And so um, finally, uh, as, I, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, in your own life as the mom of three sons and your own expatriate um, experience, what would you say are your best tips or hacks that you could pass on to, to expat wives and moms who also have professional ambitions? Um, I think my, and I mentioned earlier, one of my strengths is to organize chaos. Like I would truly rather take everything out of the garage and clean and reorganize than do the dishes every day because that repetitive, like mm -hmm. uh, doing the dishes every day, it feels like, didn't I just do this? Wait a minute. I just did this. <laughs> and so that big hairy project, that is one of my strengths, like to take on those kind of things. So knowing that about myself and that, that's how I run my lives. I stay organized about everything. So my kids are, uh, I have three boys. They're 19, 21, and 22. So all college age. One is done with college. One is taking a break. And one is going to go to welding school. So they're all in different stages. Um, but I had everything color-coded. And I had, uh, we had shared calendars. So um, kid stuff was, you know, a certain color. My work stuff was red. Personal stuff was green. So everything was color-coded. All my kids stuff was color coded so that we know whose backpack was who. So there wasn't any time wasted figuring out stuff like that. I think the other part is some things you just have to let go. Like you, you can't do everything all at the same time. You can do a lot of things, but you can't do everything all at the same time. The other thing that I think is so important, and it took me a long time to learn this, is be present. So if you're at work, be at work. If you're at home, be at home. If you're concentrating on something for your kids, then concentrate on something for your kids. But that presence, let me be better at that role. So if I was in a mom role, it let me be better at that role. If I was fundraising, it, it let me be better at that role. If I were at work, it let me be a better executive. Um, so that presence is really important. And I think we can get overwhelmed and we can be like, oh, but I have these 15 things to do. I, I'm, try, I'm trying to make dinner. I'm trying to, you know, help my kids with homework. All of that, like push, pull, um, overwhelm can just keep us from focusing on what we're doing. And I think if you could take a deep breath and take like three deep breaths and just... What am I, what's the most important thing for me to be doing right now? Making dinner. Okay, then I'm gonna, I'm gonna make dinner and I'm not gonna worry about anything else. Or if I am, then I'm gonna keep a notepad nearby and write it down and then let it go and go back to what I was doing. Because if you're pulled in so many directions and I spent years like this, because I was at a crazy startup and it just was the nature of what I was doing. But if you can be present in whatever you're doing, it's gonna be more effective. 
Mm. So that organization plus the presence, I think were kind of the two tips that I could say I learned the hard way. <laughs> so I'm naturally organized. We are so hard. hard. I'm just thinking of my own life. How often knowing this, you know, am I not fully present or kind of torn or, or yeah. yeah I spend a lot of time torn between worlds and trying to juggle it all. And I, if, when I started um, meditating and being more present, um, things went better. Yeah. Like, like yeah. it happened better and it was more, um, oh, what's uh, like effective. Like it was, it was just better. Yeah. You can imagine that. And I actually just recently read an article uh, that was talking about how women for, you know, decades have prided themselves of how good they, they are at multitasking, but really it's not the best and most effective thing to do because it actually keeps you really scattered. Mm -hmm. And, uh, we, you know, we hear a, a lot about this mental load that women have. And I can so relate to that, you know, as a, as a mompreneur, like I like to say, abroad also. I mean, there are a million things that are going on in your mind. But actually, multitasking isn't the best thing that we can do. So we should stop being so proud of it, maybe, and just trying to be more, more focused and, and narrow it down to what we're actually doing. <laughs> Yeah, you know, there are days when I start out doing one thing and I do 15 others and then I'm like, wait a minute, how did I get off so off track? Yeah. <laughs> because other, those other things were weighing on my mind heavier than the thing I had started out doing. So there is a little bit of prioritization in there. Um, sometimes when I find myself getting off track, I'll be, wait a minute, and I'll take a deep breath and I'll say, what's important now? Like right now, what's the most important thing for me to be doing? Mm -hmm. And and it brings it right back to the clarity and the goals. Like, what am I trying to do? Like if yeah. I'm trying to write a presentation and I've gone off and now I'm looking at email as opposed to writing my presentation. Okay, that's not helping. Let's stop, do that. Turn my email off <laughs> uh, and concentrate on getting the, that presentation done. So what's important for me to do right now? And so my day today is gonna be exactly that because I've got a presentation tomorrow morning at nine o'clock. So <laughs> I've got to finish that. So. I know if I get distracted that that, you know, comes right back to what's important now. Yeah, <laughs> great. Well, uh, thank you so much again, Sonia. This uh, session has been value packed and I think we all learned so much of just what we can do when we still feel a little stuck and, and are not sure, should we pursue our goals, you know, that might be professional, they might not be, but just kind of like our, our own goals, which is really what the Empowered Expert Life is about. And so um, can you tell us now if people want to find out more about you, you mentioned your new book. I know you're working on a new course as well that's coming out. Can you tell us real quick where people can stay in touch with you and take advantage of all these great things that you're working on? Yeah, I actually have a little thing. I printed it for you. Oh, great. <laughs> so, SoniaSigler.com is my website. And book is going to get you welcome to the next level, which is the book you mentioned to begin with. And if you do book two, Wait, huh? number two, that'll get you the, the new book, what's uh, next for my career. And you can contact me at that email address. And I'm happy to answer questions, happy to um, talk people through what they need. And then um, I work with people on a one-on-one -on -one basis attached to my online courses. And I work with entrepreneurs on a um, eight week quarterly basis. So eight weeks spread out over a quarter. And as you mentioned, the online classes, I've got one that accompanies the first book and then I'm recording my last session tomorrow for the second book. So then all that content will be ready and on demand. So I had to take the, the knowledge uh, in, of the book and put it into practice, I'm guessing. Yeah, exactly. And I have exercises associated with everything in there to help people really work through those things. So when we talked about what do you want and getting that clarity and, and those fears that can get in the way and figuring out what you're stuck on or why you're stuck and getting, getting to know yourself better, um, those exercises can be really helpful. And then it also can help to actually talk through with a coach, uh, you know, one-on-one -on -one to figure out, okay, what's really going on here. Like a, a sounding board, they say. Yeah, exactly. It is so it is. important. I think the other thing I find that people hire me for is the accountability. So just oh, yeah. getting to the bottom of what they want and then having that ongoing accountability. Yeah, again, it's so easy to make excuses when someone's <laughs> waiting for the results. Right. then you're you're about to do it yeah 
<laughs> ah, great. Okay, so I'm going to put all of your contact details and all of, of the links in the session notes. Okay. So check, check it all out. Check Science Books out and her courses. Um, and with that, I thank you so much again, Sonia, for being here, for sharing your wisdom with us. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you again. And I will be back with you ladies next week. Bye. <laughs>